could get all the adults to come up front and sit down up front, and if you would behave as well as the rest of the children, I would greatly appreciate that this morning. Well, good morning and uh, Merry Christmas. Don't you just love getting together and singing uh, Christmas carols with one another and coming together and uh, raising our voices in thanksgiving and praise? Well, Christmas is just a few days away, and I just uh, wanted to let you know that if you've not completed your Christmas shopping, you're in good company. Recent survey says that over 40% of people have not completed their Christmas shopping. I drove through Colorado Mills yesterday, and I'm pretty sure that we are above average in our community. As uh, the police were directing traffic, people coming in and out. Uh, I hope that's why they were there and not uh, trying to uh, uh, keep crowd control. But we love facts. We like to fact check people. We like to demand facts. We like to check social media posts. And then when people post something wrong, we go to Snopes.com and then we get the article and we stick it in the comments below that. We memorize facts for school. And we love to demand them. A fact is something that is known or can be proved to be true. A fact is verifiable. The facts are the same for everyone. On Christmas morning in Golden, Colorado, the sun will rise at 7.20 a.m. It doesn't matter whether your kids get up at 4 a.m. going, Mom, Dad, it's time to open gifts. It doesn't matter if you were like me. When I was a kid, uh, uh, I was the last one to get up on Christmas morning, and the rule at our house was nobody could... Uh, could wake me up. Uh, we got to sleep as long as we uh, wanted. I, I was very patient. I knew that the gifts would be there, so I like to sleep in. But it doesn't uh, matter who you are. It doesn't matter whether you believe in Christmas or celebrate it or not. 7.20 on Christmas morning, that's when the sun will come up. Well, with Christmas just being a few days away, I thought it would be fun to share some interesting facts about some Christmas carols. So let's start with Jingle Bells. Jingle Bells was written by James Lord Pierpont to celebrate Thanksgiving and was the first song uh, performed in space. So at your next uh, Thanksgiving meal or the next time you're in space, maybe you should sing a few verses of Jingle Bells before you carve the turkey. You can all hold hands and sing it. It'd be a great family time. How about Hark the Herald Angels Sing? Uh, Felix uh, Mendelssohn composed this tune as a tribute to the, print, uh, to the printer and inventor of the printer, Johann Gutenberg. As you may know, the Gutenberg Press began the revolution of the printed Bible back in the 1450s. Um, how about, uh, do you hear what I hear? Um, I don't know if you knew this, but this was inspired by the Cuban Missile Crisis as a plea for peace back in the 1960s. And then, Go Tell It on the Mountain is an African-American spiritual song uh, compiled by John Wesley Work, dating back to the 1865, which is about the same time First Baptist Church of Golden was founded. It's considered a Christmas carol because of its original lyrics that celebrate the nativity, that celebrate the birth of Jesus. So we talked about facts. Let's talk about beliefs. How is a belief different than a fact? Belief is trust. Belief is faith. Belief is confidence in someone or something else. A belief is conviction based on value. For example, I believe Christmas trees are, uh, real Christmas trees are superior to artificial trees. That's my belief. I believe Hark the Herald Angels Sing is the best Christmas carol that we sing each year, and that's why I picked it for this morning. It also goes along with our message, but it's a belief. So I thought it would be interesting to point out a couple of uh, uh, statistics about, uh, from some beliefs in our uh, culture. One is one in four people check their horoscope daily. One in four carry a good luck charm, or maybe they wear them. Is that a good luck charm? <laughs> Interestingly, one in seven believe in Bigfoot. Look to your left. Look to your right. Someone in your row thinks Bigfoot is real. <laughs> we all know who it is, so collectively point to that person in your row that believes in Bigfoot. <laughs> Our 
our society has a strange love-hate relationship with uh, facts and beliefs. In one breath, we demand facts and proof, while in the next minute, we're reaching for our lucky pair of socks before the game. In one minute, we, are, we will challenge the existence of God, while the next minute, we will check our horoscopes in the hopes of finding out answers to life's circumstances. Today, we're going to be looking at a rather ordinary, some rather ordinary shepherds as they have a supernatural encounter with angels. We'll be examining the facts revealed by the angelic hosts. We will observe how the encounter impacted the shepherd's belief system. Pray with me as we begin to look at our text this morning. Gracious Father, you are the creator of the universe. You're the author of everything. You chose such a humble way intentionally to send your son, the Savior, the Messiah, into the world. It was out of your love for us, it was out of your love for me, that you sent your son to die, to pay the price for our sins, for my sins. You are generous, you're loving, you're forgiving, you're all-powerful, you truly are a good father. We sing, we celebrate, we give gifts, we proclaim the birth of the Messiah, and we praise you for that. This morning, would you open our eyes to your word? Would you open our hearts to your message? Close our ears this morning to the noise of the world. Speak the truth. We pray this this morning in your son's name. Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, today's passage is Luke 2, 13 and 14. As we continue the series that we've been going through for the past few weeks with uh, songs of praise, today we'll be focused on the angels' uh, song of praise. Um, I'll be reading mostly from the New International Version, which is the same version that you'll find in the Pew Bible in front of you. I will also be having uh, our team project up the words on the screen. So whatever is easiest, if you want to use your phone, if you want to use the printed Bible, or if you want to follow along the screen, um, that's where we'll be finding most of today's text. And the text reads, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. What an incredible announcement. What an incredible way to make such an announcement. Why did God choose an angelic uh, chorus to make this announcement? Well, based on the observations I could see, I can only assume he wanted it to be grand, he wanted it to be loud, and he wanted it to be clear. He wanted the shepherds to know it was a heavenly proclamation. He did not want them to be mistaken. But before we look at the uh, announcement, I think it's important that we get some context. We'll be jumping into the middle of the passage, so let's go back a few verses to get some context for this declaration. So we'll just uh, go back a few verses to Luke 2, uh, 8, where it reads, And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Being a shepherd was hard work. Being a shepherd was dangerous work. It involved lots of late days, late nights, and really they had a, a one key, key uh, function, and that was to protect the flock. Can I be a little bit vulnerable with you today just for a minute? I'm not a big fan of the dark. Who is not a big fan of the dark? Okay, the rest of you, I'm not sure how honest you're being. But there's lots of shadows, there's lots of unrecognized sounds that almost seem to get magnified um, at night. Um, you can hear the rustling of the leaves or the snap of a twig, and my brain thinks the worst. It's definitely Bigfoot. <laughs> at least there's a one in seven chance that it's Bigfoot. But some scholars have described the shepherds as social outcasts while others assert shepherds were just merely the working class. But regardless, shepherds were not scholars, they were not the politically powerful, they were not the religious leaders. Um, in our culture, we might call them the average Joe. 
God chose to reveal his king, the Messiah, to a rather ordinary group of shepherds, some rather ordinary Joes. Verse 9 goes on to say, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. First, Luke specifically identifies them as an angel of the Lord. Some scholars think that it could be Gabriel, the same angel that uh, speaks to Mary in Luke 126. We looked at that last week. The shepherd's reaction of fear is certainly understandable, but it was more than them just being caught off guard. You know, if you think about it, shepherds were somewhat accustomed to the dark. They were somewhat accustomed to being caught off guard. They were accustomed to working the night shift. But it was not common for this type of heavenly um, proclamation, this heavenly re uh, revelation. For the past 400 years, God had been silent. When you turn the page from the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, and you flip over one page to the book of Matthew in the New Testament, there is a 400-year gap that has occurred. This is often referred to as the intertestimonial period. During this time, no prophet had spoken. It's called the silent period. Not only were the shepherds not accustomed to hearing this type of revelation, really nobody was. Jamestown Settlement. Just as a point of reference, I thought it'd be interesting. What was happening 400 years ago in the United States? George Washington hadn't been born yet. The first permanent English settlement, Jamestown, is being established. It was now called the state of Virginia. I, I have family that live in this area, and I've had the opportunity to go and visit, and it's pretty cool. They have this uh, uh, Jamestown settlement, this uh, recreation uh, of what, it's what it was like to live in that time frame, and I can just tell you a lot has changed in 400 years. They did not have iPhones, which I was personally shocked. <laughs> I thought they'd been around forever. I tell, I tell my kids that I went to college before the internet was uh, invented. Therefore, I must have attended the Jamestown Settlement University. God's silence to uh, Israel for 400 years was certainly significant. It was certainly noticed. Nobody, including the shepherds, had heard from God or from the prophets, nor had their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, and I could go on and on. The shepherd's fear is not a surprise. Not only do I have a healthy fear of the dark, I'm not a huge fan of being woken up in the middle of the night. It never seems like it's good news. Someone is sick, the car has been broke, is broken down, the smoke detector battery is going off. Why do they only go off at night? I don't understand. I, they, they must be programmed uh, to do such. As I've told my teenage daughters, not a lot of good things happen after midnight. So why do I get, uh, so why I get, uh, so I get why the angels had to calm everybody down. Verses 10 and 11 say, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. The angels came the angels did the same thing with Mary back in uh, Luke 1.30 when, uh, when Gabriel says, Do not be afraid. Then the angels reveal the, that they have good news. Can you think of a time that you've uh, received some good news? Maybe you uh, got the uh, letter from the college that you've been admitted. Maybe you got a, a phone call or an email saying you've got the job. Uh, maybe it's uh, finding out that you're having a baby. Um, maybe it's a medical test that uh, came back negative, or maybe it's a medical test that came back positive. But it wasn't just good news. It was great news. It was arguably the best news. The king is coming. The promised Messiah is coming. They'd been waiting for years. They'd been waiting for decades. They'd been waiting for generations. They had been waiting for centuries 
for this to occur. Verse 12 says, This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. I think the shepherds may have paused at this point for a moment. Our king is a baby? Perhaps even stranger? He's going to be lying in a manger, a feed trough? This is how we feed our sheep. This is not how we welcome our royalty. They would have understood a manger was not a crib for a king. Perhaps the fear had shifted a little bit to some confusion. The angel song of praise in Luke 2, 13 and 14 is really a response to the proclamation in verse 11. What is a proclamation? It is an official announcement, a public declaration of something really, really important. I'd like to talk through a couple of examples of some, a few proclamations that you may be familiar with. The Emancipation Proclamation. Proclamation 95 was a presidential proclamation, an executive order given by the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, effective January 1st, 1863. This order changed the legal status of 3.5 million slaves. A great proclamation. Neil Armstrong in 1969, radioing back to earth the famous proclamation. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind as he stepped onto the moon. This marked mankind stepping off planet Earth onto lunar soil for the first time. That's what I thought. <laughs> and finding out it was not made of cheese. That was the other thing they found out. While both of these proclamations and stepping onto the moon are certainly historic and they're certainly significant, the pronouncement of the angels in verse 11, a savior has been born to you and he is the Messiah, the Lord, has global, eternal implications for every single person around the world and throughout the ages. It is perhaps the most uh, famous and the most important proclamation in history. Thank you for that amen. What was the response? Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Wow, let me emphasize that again. Glory to God in the highest. We offered a bit of a sneak peek of what uh, heaven will be like, a glimpse of what it will be like to join the angelic chorus. I can only think of one time uh, in my life where I have felt some of that same excitement, and it was when we went to Japan a couple of years ago, and we were able to sing with a 500-person choir and sing uh, gospel songs together. And uh, it was great because we were, we were there with people from other nations, some that didn't even speak our language, yet we came together as one and we were able to make that proclamation, to make that declaration of the glory of God. And it was just awesome. The singing of this chorus was an emphasis of the message. It wasn't just uh, conveying the facts. They could have just said it um, Jesus is the Savior, and easily moved on. I don't know if you've ever been to a musical or if you've ever watched an animated uh, Disney movie, um, but this, the chorus being sung really kind of serves as an opportunity to reflect on the facts. So take the musical, I guess it's also an animated feature, it's also a live action, but The Lion King. And then if you've ever seen, uh, seen that, you'll see Simba, and he's that young lion, and he's, he's o uh, looking over the, uh, over the land, and he, gets, uh, he, he finds out from, uh, from his dad that he's going to be the king over all, uh, all of, the, uh, of this area. And he sings the song, I Just Can't Wait to Be King. I was going to break out and sing the song, but for obvious reasons I won't. But just saying the words doesn't provide the same intensity. It doesn't provide the same emotion. It does not capture uh, the, the, uh, the importance of that moment. 
and it um, and that really by singing that out it really provides an opportunity to reflect the angelic uh, chorus proclaiming glory to God in the highest provides that reflection to the on this world changing message that the Messiah is here as we sit and sing hark the herald angels sing together it's an opportunity for us to reflect on this great proclamation on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests the Hebrew word used here for peace is shalom it's really a common greeting you may have uh, even today you've maybe you've talked to a Jewish person and they'll say instead of saying hello or how you're doing they'll say shalom well what are they saying you know they're not referring to the peace of absence of war they're not going up to you and saying I'm happy you're not having a war <laughs> I'm, not, I'm happy you're at peace no they're talking about a more profound peace we're talking about a, a peace such as uh, health or prosperity or contentment or security we're wishing somebody well we're giving them best wishes Keep in mind the people of Judah were not were under Roman rule. They were experiencing high taxes, power-hungry politicians, a decaying moral society. I would be remiss if I didn't pause and say, does this not sound a little bit familiar <laughs> to maybe our own culture today? They were not in military conflict, but they would not describe their situation as peaceful. In fact, they had a term for it, and it was called Roman peace. And really what that meant was that while they were not in military conflict, they were under a great oppression by the Roman rule. On whom his favor rests is not a common uh, English phrase. Um, I like how the message interprets it, and it reads, Peace to all men and women on earth who please him. Peace to all who please him. What does it mean? What does God's favor rest on? What does it mean to please him? You may remember uh, this from last week when we looked at Mary's song in Luke chapter 1 in verse 50. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Well, God's peace and grace is offered to all it is exclusively available to those who fear him it is universally available but unfortunately it's not universally accepted to directly answer the pre previous question of who does God's favor rest on his mercy extends to those who fear him God is pleased with those who fear him not fear like I'm frightened because you woke me up in the middle of the night type of frightened or fear. It is the respect and love a child has for a parent. Not afraid of being punished, but a desire to please, a desire to obey. What does it mean to fear God? It is an acknowledgement of God's authority, God's position, then obeying and following out of love for that. Crossroads is a place where one must decide a direction. It's a set of paths or a set of options that have been presented, and you must decide which way to go. We have to decide if we're going to go. I'm going to try to do this correct so that it's the right. Uh, your your left, or your right, or my right, or your left. I can't do that again. <laughs> I'll get confused. Or whether we're going to go north or south, or whether we're going to go west or we're going to go east. The shepherds were at a crossroad. They had heard the angel's proclamation. The shepherds could have went back to sleep, convinced themselves that they had had a horrible dream and that the angelic uh, encounter was not real. They could have simply ignored uh, uh, the, the, procla uh, the proclamation or they had a choice to embrace that proclamation and make it their own. In verse 15 it says, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the, uh, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. The shepherds' reaction to the angelic proclamation was to seek the Savior. They went searching for Jesus. 
they believed the message that the Messiah was here. Not everyone who heard the message about baby Jesus reacted like the shepherds. Uh, we're not going to be able to catch all the characters this morning, but let's take a look at Herod. Who is King Herod? He was the appointed ruler of Judea. His family had political ties to Julius Caesar, the Roman dictator. That's probably how he got his appointment uh, into this position. King Herod was famous for many of his great community projects, including uh, building seaports, uh, constructing buildings, the expansion of Temple Mount. He was uh, successful in many ways. But he was also known for his tyranny, his lust, his paranoia. His cruelty reveals itself as he killed off one of his, wi uh, one of his wives, as well as uh, killing off two of his siblings because he was threatened by their power and that, that he thought he was going to uh, possibly be, uh, have his throne threatened by them. He was also married nine times. Um, he was certainly a, a, a man of um, both great accomplishment and great tyranny. So how does Herod react to the news? that a Messiah was born today. Well, in order to get context, let's go back to, a little bit to the beginning of Matthew 2 with the Magi. We also call them the wise men. I'm going to read uh, Matthew 2, verses 1 through 4. Um, I'm going to read it from the message, so if you would just listen as I read. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem village, Judah territory, this was during Herod's kingship. A band of scholars arrived in Jerusalem from the east. They asked around, where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? We observe a star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth. We're on a pilgrimage to worship him. When the word of their inquiry got to Herod, he was terrified. And not Herod alone, but most of Jerusalem as well. Herod lost no time. He gathered all the high priests and religious scholars in the city together and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? Herod is terrified. Why in the world is this mighty king terrified of this little baby? Well, he is terrified because he has threatened there, there is someone that could come after his throne. His power is being threatened by this little baby in a manger. In verse 13 uh, of Matthew, it goes on to say, After the Magi's visit and present their gifts, Joseph has a dream. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in the dream, and it says, Get up, he said. Take the child, his mother, and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the king to kill him. When Herod finds this out, he is very upset. He is uh, upset that he has been that uh, that he has uh, been somewhat tricked. And it says in verse 16, when Herod realizes that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with uh, the time he had learned from the Magi. It is certainly not shocking that Herod wanted to kill this child that would be king of the Jews. He was the king. No baby was going to threaten, uh, threaten his rule. Notice Herod did not doubt that Jesus was born. He didn't doubt the claims of the Magi. Herod was defiant to the message of the Savior. He was not willing to give up his position or give up his authority. He didn't lack facts. He simply lacked belief. Belief in the Messiah. Sometimes we confuse belief with facts. He acknowledged them, but he was not willing to surrender to them. We started talking off. Of, we started today talking uh, talking about facts. Just as a reminder, facts are known. 
facts can be proven. A fact is verifiable. Belief is trust. Belief is faith. Belief is confidence in someone or something else. Acknowledging the birth of Christ is important. It is foundational. However, King Herod acknowledged the birth of Christ. The difference between King Herod and the shepherds is what they did with the facts, what they did with the proclamation. The shepherds sought the Savior, whereas Herod tried to kill him. Why? We talked about it before. Defiance. Herod did not want anyone to threaten his rule. He did not anyone he did not want to give up his throne. During the Christmas season, many people recognized the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They will put up a nativity scene, they'll exchange gifts, they will sing Christmas carols. You turn it on to Cozy 101 and you'll hear Christmas carols 24 hours a day uh, for the month of December. My question is, do they believe in the Christmas carol? Do they believe in the proclamation that is given? Hark the Herald Angels Sing is a song of celebration, giving credit to God for the great news. We have that same opportunity to celebrate. We can sing and proclaim just like the angels did in uh, verses 13 and 14. Um, I know it's kind of unusual, but I think it will give us a chance to really kind of digest the words. But instead of singing this, uh, uh, these four lines from Hark the Herald Angels Sing, would you guys uh, say, that, uh, say them with me? So they're up on the screen. So let's just read together. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King, Peace on Earth and Mercy Mild, God and sinners reconciled. Do you acknowledge the fact or do you believe in Jesus the Savior? Luke 2, 17 and 18 say, When we have seen him, they will spread the word concerning what had been told, the, uh, told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Like the angels... The shepherds demonstrated their belief in their proclamation. They went and spread the word. They didn't keep this to themselves. They made a declaration. When we conclude our service this morning, we will sing together uh, the song, Go Tell It on the Mountain. We will all have an opportunity to join in this chorus. Don't leave this place today without looking and reflecting about what your belief is without considering whether you're seeking the Savior, without considering whether you believe in the Christmas carol. If you believe it, proclaim it. Don't be afraid to go tell it on the mountain. We'll have an opportunity on Tuesday when we gather at 530 to invite our neighbors, to invite our friends, to make that same declaration for us to go and say, not only do we believe the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, I believe it, and I'm going to uh, follow and surrender to that, that I am going to become a follower of Christ as a result of it. We think of a lot of different passages of Scripture around uh, uh, Christmas, and many of them come from the Gospel accounts of the Nativity. But I think the one that uh, should strike us most, and it's one that's very familiar to us, really is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's not whoever acknowledges the fact, it's but whoever truly believes in their heart. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning humbly because of the facts that we look at in the nativity we see that you sent your son you sacrificed him you let him come as a, a little baby to live on this earth and we know that he came for the sole purpose to die 
to be hung on a cross to endure suffering and pain on our account because we choose not to follow you. But you did it so that we could have life eternal. You did it so that we could um, have a relationship with you forever. Lord, I just pray this holiday season, this Christmas celebration, this preparation for Wednesday when we celebrate the babe coming to the earth to live amongst us, that we will truly look and see whether we're following you, whether we're proclaiming, whether we have a belief in you, that it's not just a fact acknowledgement that we give, but it is a true surrender. It's a true relationship. It's a true fear that we have of you. This morning, I would just pray for our community. I pray for our neighbors. I pray for our friends. We pray for those that we encounter that will sing the song. They will sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We, will, we pray 